All right. Good to see a huge crowd here this morning. You guys, a lot of you back from vacation, so I uh, hope you enjoyed yourself. Just as a reminder, I hadn't said anything about this last couple weeks. Uh, Dylan, our worship pastor right here, he and his wife, Emily, and their two kids will be leaving next Sunday after church on their trip to New Mexico. If you hadn't heard about that, uh, Noble, their oldest son, struggles with autism and is um, not as quite as verbal as, as he could be. They said he talks plenty at, at home in, in phrases and things like that. Um, but, of course, he's old enough that in the next year or so he's going to be going into school. And so they really uh, want to try to get him on track, bring him up to speed, get him ready for that. But there is some sort of groundbreaking treatment um, it's new in the medical field. It's non-medicinal, but it has shown great promise uh, for kids like Noble in helping them develop their speech and the ability to interact and to um, you know, take their thoughts and formulate words and sentences. So um, we, have, we have come alongside of them because it's, it's somewhat of an expensive trip. It's about $6,000 for them to, to go. It's um, a two, two-and-a-half-week journey out there, treatments, and back, and so forth. And so uh, they're going to leave next, next week. And I just wanted to say, one, I appreciate everybody who has been so generous so far in helping them um, raise money to, to take this trip and to provide for their family. It, he's, it's been a huge blessing to Dylan. He's, he's told me, he says, man, we have never been a part of a church that has been so loving and so generous toward us in any way. And I told him that in the beginning. I said, listen, I know you're new here, and, and you might not take me seriously, I said, but New Life is a giving church. And if they see a need and they believe in it, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're going to have everything that you need. And he's just been blown away. So, one, thank you guys for doing that. Two, if you have intended to give but just haven't done so yet, uh, today and next Sunday will be your last opportunities to do that. Um, if you want us to run it through the church to sort of give you credit for actually having given a charitable gift, then you need to do that today. Or um, you could probably come bring it by the office sometime this week. If not, you can just give it straight to Dylan. And like I said, you won't get credit for that here on this earth, but I'm sure the Lord's taking credit. Uh, quite an accurate account of who's doing what. So don't worry about it, right? Um, so I'm just letting you know, if, if you've been wanting to do that, this Sunday, next Sunday will be your last opportunities. Then, of course, um, Anita mentioned Kids Jam tonight. Man, that's, that's exciting. One of the biggest times. Well, at least Christine's happy. She's excited about it. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, this is a huge time for us. It's, it's one of our biggest events. It's one of our best outreach events of your entire year. I mean, we have not only all of our uh, kids here at New Life coming out, but them bringing their friends, family, people in their neighborhood. So if you have a kid that's going to be participating in Kids Jam this week, whether it's your child or grandchild or niece or nephew, encourage them to invite their friends. Help them do that. If they have a friend that needs to go pick it up, then you volunteer to do that. It's going to be a great Great week, and I just want to say out at the start of this thing, thank you to all the volunteers. Um, some of our volunteers and staff, they've already done an incredible job with, you know, with all the set and, and the decorations, getting rooms ready. A uh, lot of work that's been going on, and so th they have just done a, a super, super job. So we appreciate that. But they'll start tonight on their journey that we started just a few weeks ago. Um, because when we come out for Kids Jam, it's not just about fun, it's not just crafts and, and activities and refreshments and stuff like that. Uh, we really teach the gospel. And every single night, we gather all those kids, it may be 100 to 150 kids, into this auditorium, which all the seats will be gone, but we get them in here and, and we act out these Bible lessons for them and teach them about Jesus and, and who He is for us and and how he's provided a way for us. So that's going to start tonight as we talk to the kids about how Jesus rescues the lost. You remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about those three parables that Jesus uh, taught. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost silver coin, and the lost son. And how Jesus loves the lost. He's looking for the lost. 
He locates them and liberates them. And so then we followed that up last week. If you missed last week's message, and it's not just because I preached it, but it's a good one. All right, there's a lot of people in here just really, I felt, were, were just liberated from a lot of stresses. We talked about worry and how Jesus rescues the worry uh, from, I think it was uh, the story of Mary and Martha. Mary was the one she chose to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him teach. But her sister Martha, she ran frantic around the house. She had Jesus as, as company. And she ran around so frantically. And Jesus called her out and said, Listen, Martha, you're worried and upset about so many things. But only one thing's really needed. And for me, I hope that she understood and, and got that one thing. But today we're going to follow along. And this is where our kids this week, as they travel this same path, they'll be talking on Tuesday night um, from the story that we're going to talk about today. And it goes hand in hand with last week's message, but we want to focus today on the fact that Jesus rescues the struggling. All right, obviously, if you've got something on your mind that you've been worried about, it's probably closely connected to what you would say today is your struggle. And Jesus rescues the struggling. And we're going to look at a, a passage in Matthew chapter 26. So if you've got your Bible or if you follow along with us using the Bible app or some other device, then, then that's fine. But look at Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to read about 10 verses here from this chapter, verse uh, 36 through 46. The event here that we're looking at is when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before His crucifixion. And so Matthew 26, starting in verse 36, says... Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, so Peter, James, and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther... He fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and he prayed, My father... If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and he prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Quick question, uh, how many of you in here are gardeners? You don't have to be a good one. Right. Okay, a few. Big garden, little garden, it, it doesn't really matter. It might be a vegetable garden, it might be a flower garden, um, all different types of, of gardens. I'm not really either of those. Um, you guys know that I try to keep a, a nice looking lawn, and so I would consider myself a, somewhat of a, a gardener. I grew up around those things. My grandfather always had a big, big garden. But when I think about gardens, I mean, most of the thoughts are, are good thoughts. When you think about a vegetable garden, um, you think about all the stuff that, you know, the tomatoes and the cucumbers and, you know, everything that you're going to be, you're going to be receiving from that garden. If you're more of a flower gardener, uh, you think about how nice it is if, if you just like to sit by the garden, walk through it. Uh, maybe you like to go around and visit these really big botanical gardens and those kinds of things. Just the smells and the colors, and the sights that you see. So most of the time when we think about gardens, it's a pleasant thought. Some people even have uh, fruit gardens. That makes me think of when I go to India and I stay with James. Usually I'm there two, maybe even three weeks. And with us traveling around, we usually stay in, in a hotel here and there. Um, but sometimes, you know, for at least a few days during the trip, we will go to a house that we call the garden house. 
Right? James has his personal house um, in, in Kerala, but in the state of Tamanado, where he does most of his ministry, they own a second house that, again, we call the garden house. And the reason we call it that is because it sits on 50 acres of land, like right in the middle, and it's surrounded by coconut and mango trees that, that James plants, grows, and harvests for personal income and for income for the ministry. But it sits right in the middle of all these trees, and, and you got wild peacocks, and I mean, just it's one of the most peaceful places you could be. You get away from all of the hustle, all the busyness, and all the people that are in India, and you step into this little um, compound, as it would, and, and it's just tranquil. It's a place where I can go personally and just relax, rest, recharge, because being that far away from home, other than James' personal house, the garden house for me is the next best thing to home. I, I feel that comfortable at this place. So most of the time, when we think about gardens, it's a good thing. They're fruitful places. They're refreshing and relaxing. They're, they're producing. We think of them as being somewhat tranquil and you know, you can, you can be at rest. But we all know, or at least most of us, I think, know that gardens can also be a struggle, right? Those of you who have them know that. If you're not aware of that, go plant one. You will quickly discover how much of a struggle it can be. When it begins to produce, how much of a struggle a garden can really be. It was uh, within the first two, two or three years, Jessica and I came to the church and we became really close friends with an older couple here in our church. And um, the gentleman, he's since passed, and his wife is not in the best of health, so she, didn't get, she doesn't get to come much at all anymore. But we became really close friends. Now, they were old enough probably to be our grandparents. But they were, they were like friends. You'd think they were in their 30s, just like we were, because we'd just go out to eat. We'd have a good time. We'd go hang out with them at their house. But they always had a big garden. I mean, when I say a big garden, I'm talking about as big as this room. And would load us down. Tomatoes, squash, zucchini, cucumbers, corn, more than we could possibly eat. And he would give not only to us, but other people in the church. His name was Jimmy. And when Jimmy, when he got his, he, he had a, a, a bout with cancer, went into remission. When it came back the second time, it was really, really bad and took its toll on him physically, and he was unable to go out and actually work his garden, which was something that he loved to do. He had already had it planted, it was producing, and then he got really sick, and there was no way for him to get out there and do the work. And, and so Jessica and a few of the ladies here at the church at the time decided, you know, we'll go over and we'll help. We'll bring in some of the stuff from the garden and try to help him out. And here was the thing. He said... And their eyes like got this big when this happened. He said, anything you pick, you can have. You keep it. I just give it to you. Now, my wife loves fresh vegetables, especially green beans. And all the green beans needed picking that day. I knew what she was in for, but I didn't tell her. I was like, yeah, go out there and, you know, have at it. You know, enjoy yourself. This will be great. You know, you guys are working for Jesus, you know. But anyway... She went out, and about four or five hours later, she came back home, walked through the front door with two big five-gallon buckets of green beans, soaking wet with sweat. She sat those things down on, on the kitchen floor, and she says, I never want to do that again. <laughs> right? I knew that was what was going to happen, because I grew around that stuff. I'm like, you ain't going to find me within two miles of that... You know, that garden. But uh, that was about the time I encouraged her by saying, well, you know all of those have to be stringed, right? <laughs> yeah. You picked them, you string them, right? But uh, anyway, you know that, that gardens can, can really be a struggle. They're hard work. They really are. And the Garden of Gethsemane, where we find Jesus here in Matthew 26, it's no different. It's not your typical garden like what we might think of, a flower garden or a vegetable or a fruit garden. Um, but the, the Garden of Gethsemane was an olive garden. It, it's still there today at the base of the Mount of Olives. It's, a, it's basically a grove of 
olive trees. And that's where Jesus would often go to pray, to get away, to relax, find some solitude. In fact, Luke tells us in the same story in his, in his gospel that Jesus went out as usual. He actually uses those words. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. This was a regular habit of him to go out to this place, to recharge, to unwind, to relax, to pray. But that place, a place that was peaceful, that was a place of solitude for Jesus, quickly became a place of struggle. And now it can be expected, because it's interesting to find out, that the Garden of Gethsemane, the word Gethsemane in Hebrew means olive or oil press. It just basically describes what you do there. This was a grove of olive trees. They were planted there for a particular reason, to harvest those olives and then to press them and crush them for their oil like you would grapes for wine. It represents, by its own name, a place of struggle, a place where things are are crushed and put under great pressure. So in a way, this place that was once a place of solitude for Jesus became a place of struggle because it was a place where he felt crushed, where he experienced a tremendous amount of pressure. And what we see in the Gospels here, Matthew and the others, is that There is an emotional intensity in this story that we see coming from Jesus that we don't see anywhere else in the Gospels. We rarely see Jesus react to anything like He does here in this garden. Matthew tells us that when He left His three disciples alone, He went off to pray, that He began to be sorrowful and troubled. And those words mean that that He was beginning to experience extreme grief and anguish. Verse 38, his own words, he says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now think about that for a second. Jesus says, I'm overwhelmed. How extraordinary does the struggle and the pressure have to be for Jesus to say, I feel overwhelmed. If we're talking about you and me, I mean, we understand that. But we're talking about God in the flesh here. We usually don't think about Jesus using words like overwhelmed. Because overwhelmed to us communicates the idea that this is something that is too much to bear. A burden that is too heavy to carry. And then he added to that, not only is my soul overwhelmed... But he says, to the point of death. When we use phrases like that, typically we're exaggerating, obviously, right? We eat a lot of food, we eat way too much, and we're stuffed. Or, or if we eat something that doesn't really agree with us and we get a stomach ache, we might say, you know, my stomach is just killing me, right? Or we're outside in that garden. And we haven't had, had something to drink for an hour or two, and we're hot and sweaty. We might say, well, I'm thirsting to death. We're actually not dying, and our stomach's not killing us. It's just a way for us to express, by way of exaggeration, the intense pain or desire or need that we have, right? I'm convinced, though, that when Jesus said this, He wasn't exaggerating. He he was not stretching the truth at all. He knew what lie hid. In less than 24 hours, he would be nailed to a cross. And he was already beginning to feel the weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders. And that burden was drawing him closer and closer, literally, to death. If you read Luke's version, you have to remember that Luke was a physician... And a lot of times when he tells a story, he'll point out something if it has some kind of uh, medical connection to it. And this same story, when Luke tells it, he says that, that the struggle that night was so intense that as Jesus prayed at one point, his sweat became like drops of blood. Now that's pretty serious. And you think, well, that may be an exaggeration. 
And it may have been a way for Luke to, you know, explain or, or to reason out the, the intensity, but I actually got to reading, and, and it is a real condition. It's very rare. But to sweat drops of blood, or for your sweat to contain blood, is, is something that actually happens. Now, I may butcher this, this term, so you guys in the uh, medical fields, forgive me. Hematidrosis, if you did look that up uh, maybe later today, is a, is a very real but rare condition when someone's sweat glands, the vessels around them, will contract and then dilate to the point of rupture. And when they rupture, the sweat will contain blood. And as I was reading, I was like, well, what, what would cause that to happen? You know what I found out the cause for that is? Extreme anguish. Exactly what the Bible says Jesus was experiencing. My soul is overwhelmed with grief to the point of death. He's, he's having a physical and emotional reaction to this struggle. He, he, Jesus is distraught beyond anything we have ever seen. He's faced a raging sea before with just total composure. He's been eye to eye with demons, with satanic opposition, with the religious elite just grilling him, all with calmness. But here, this is different. There's something happening here in this garden that has him upset, that has him struggling like never before. And see, now, there, there's a part of us that our compassion size, man, I wish... That wasn't happening, and we feel bad for someone experiencing this. But on the other side, we need to be thankful for that. That should encourage us, because the writer of the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15, said this. The, the, this high priest, talking about Jesus, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. You know, he understands our struggles. For he faced all the same testings. A very quick word study on that word, will reveal to you that the word testings means to try, to tempt, or to struggle. Jesus has faced all of the same struggles that we do, yet He did not sin. So He understands. We can be thankful for what happened that night in the garden because it means that when we struggle, He knows what's going on. He understands what's going on in our life. He's traveled that road successfully. And which puts Jesus in a very unique situation. He is the only one who is the most competent and capable to help us in our struggle. When no one else understands what we're going through, when no one else can, can imagine the weight, Jesus knows. And He can come to the rescue. So I just want to go back to this story here in Matthew 26 and, and pull out a few of these elements, some things that, that we can see Jesus offered to us. You know, this is how we know that Jesus can help us in our struggles. And the first one is this. Jesus proves to be a friend who's ministering. In our struggles, He helps. He comes to the rescue because He's a friend who's ministering. Now, here, here at New Life, we talk a lot about community. And we encourage every single person to get involved in life groups, get involved in volunteering and events and serving. Develop friendships, develop relationships, not only here in the church, but outside in life. Because God didn't create us to do life alone. He didn't design us you know, to, to be hermits and just stay you know, socially blocked off from everybody else. God wants us to connect with other people. He, he inscribed that need on our DNA and... And I always point you back to the book of Genesis. When God created Adam, the very first man, one of his first comments was, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not a good thing. We all need a friend. And so God designed friendship because of our need and our desire to be loved and, be, and to be known. And all throughout the Bible, you'll find verses of Scripture that encourage friendship. Strong relationships. Proverbs 27 verse 9 says, The sweet smell of incense can make you feel good, but true friendship is better 
There are some things in life, material things, that you can get that will make you feel better, maybe for a moment, but true friendship. Having people who love you and truly know you and care about you, that's, that's priceless. Uh, the Bible also warns us about having the wrong kind of friendships. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It's a warning against choosing the wrong kinds of people to hang out with. Bad company corrupts good character. And then a verse like Proverbs 17, 17 shows us that God often provides for us really close friends. And a lot of those closest relationships are there because we need that in some of our deepest struggles. It says that a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. God knows what's going to happen in our life. He's going to know when we sort of bottom out and He causes someone else to be born. That, that's, that's incredible. Someone is born who is there to help us through that time. That's incredible, right? Last year, uh, when Jessica and I took our 12-week sabbatical, you know, now sabbaticals, that word means rest, all right? Like rest, relax, refresh, recharge, those, those things. Um, it was, I don't know, it took about six weeks before I ever hit that point. Initially, and, and throughout, for the most part, but initially, it was a struggle. You know, we were going through some things personally. Our church was going through. And that time, and I can't speak for Jessica. I know she was struggling, but I'll just speak for me. That time was a time of extreme emotional, spiritual struggle for me. Because I felt as if, it, this is not true, but I felt as if I was isolated and everything that I cared about, that I wanted to be involved in, that I loved, that I was you know, created to do and invested in, I felt like it was all being withdrawn, like it was being stripped away. Again, that wasn't the case, but in a time of struggle, you, you feel certain things that may not actually be so. Okay? So that's what I felt. And, and so there were some days where I was really low, you know, wondering what, what my future was going to look like, what was going to happen to the church, and just really down. Um, I had friends calling, texting. Some of them would even drop by the house just to check and just say, hey, man, you know, how you doing? Just encourage. Um, so plenty of people did that. But I had one friend who really just went, um, y'all just have to excuse me, went above and beyond. Um, we call him, <laughs> we call him Big John. He's standing back here in the back. Jonathan Potts. Now, before last year, Jonathan and I would have each said, at least I hope, that we were friends. But at least on my end, last year that went to another level. Big John, a few days after we announced that we were taking a step back, and, and we were going to be gone from the church a while, he sent me a text. You know, it's just one of those texts that was said, hey, man, I'm, I love you, I support you, I got you back, I'm praying for you, I've been there, I know what you're going through, you know, those kinds of texts. Right after that, you know, the next one he sent through was a verse of Scripture that he felt that was going to be an encouragement to me. And it was. It was cool, man. I really, really appreciated that. But let me tell you this. Every day, every day for the last year and a half, at 6.30, about in the morning, I get a text from Jonathan with a verse of Scripture, something to encourage me, something to challenge me. He, he's not only been there for me as a friend through a struggle, but beyond that, right? That's what it means to be a friend who's ministering, who sees a need and says, I'm going to do everything and more that I can to be of help. Now, Jonathan's a great guy. He's super nice, big guy. And if you let him hug you, he will rattle your eyeballs out. He's a, yeah. 
I always brace when he hugs me. Just, you know. But I can tell you right now, as, as, as a kind and as a loving guy as he is, that's not Jonathan doing that. That is Christ ministering to me. That's Jesus being a friend who is ministering. He just happens to be using John's cell phone. Yeah? <laughs> but see, that, that's what it means. We all need that. We need a friend or multiple friends who will be there to encourage us, to support us, to have our back, to challenge us. Even Jesus needed it. Why else would he have asked those guys to come along? Why did he invite them that night to come with him to that garden, to keep watch, to pray, because he knew he was going to struggle? He knew it was going to get intense. And you might say, well, yeah, they sucked. <laughs> they were terrible at it because they fell asleep. Me asked them to do one thing. They fell asleep, and then later on, when he really needed them, they all ran away. I would point out, I mean, yes, in a way they did fail. But let's cut them some slack here. At least they tried. At least they tried. They were willing to do whatever they could. Jesus admitted that. He said, guys, the spirit is willing. I know you want to. Like your heart's there. The flesh is weak. He understood that they had limitations, that their ability to support him, to encourage him, to be there for him had its limitations. It wasn't because they didn't want to. It wasn't because they didn't care about him and, and that, they, that they saw no use in praying. In fact, Luke tells us in verse 45 of Luke 22 that when he found them asleep, it was because they were exhausted from sorrow. It wasn't just that they were sleepy and didn't care. But have you ever been just so emotionally drained, you just you can't keep your eyes open? You got nothing left in the tank. That's where they were. They couldn't offer anything else. They were exhausted from sorrow. They were watching the man that they loved struggle. And they didn't know what to do with it. So our friends, even the best of friends with the best of intentions, let's just understand, sometimes they may fail. They, they may not be able to meet our need. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. It's not because they don't have a desire to, or they wouldn't if they could, but sometimes we just, we just can't. Sometimes we can't even come up with the right words to say. You ever been there? You know somebody's discouraged. You know somebody's struggling. You want to say something that'll help, but it's like nothing. Nothing's coming out, right? The disciples were that way. And in Mark 14, verse 40, that's his, that's his version of what happened. He said when Jesus asked them, you know, hey, guys, why do y'all keep going to sleep? They didn't have the words to explain to tell them what was going on and how they felt. So we all need a friend or a, or a set of friends that's going to help us. God often gives us those friends, but we need to understand those friends come with limitations. Here's the good thing. Proverbs 18, 24 says, There's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Even when all the other friends, intentionally or unintentionally, can't be there for us. Jesus always will. And he never comes up short or empty handed. He's going to always be a friend who's ministering. Another thing that we see in this story that Jesus provides for us is a father who's listening. A father who's listening, who listens. It says that he went a little distance away from his friends there, and, and Matthew said that he fell on his face and he began to pray. And he did this three different times. And every single time, he prayed the very same thing, and he began the prayer the very same way, with two words, my father. Now, you have to sit back and wonder, was that because he had a habit? That was just the way he always started his prayers? I don't know about you, a lot of times when I pray, I start out the same way. 
whether it be Father or my Father or Dear Lord Jesus, you know, it's sort of my intro. It's my, you know, it's my own ramp to prayer, right? I don't think that was necessarily the case for Jesus. He wasn't just saying my father just to acknowledge who he was talking to. It was more so to acknowledge who he knew was listening. He's the only one there, and the only one listening is the father. I'll, I'll point this out by uh, pointing you to another, another case. In John chapter 11, is another time in Jesus' life where he's really struggling because he loses a, a very close friend, Lazarus. And if you know that story, he ends up raising Lazarus from the dead. But he visits the tomb of Lazarus. And there in front of that tomb, he prays. He prays out loud. And we have a record of what he prayed. And it sounds very familiar to what he's praying in the garden. In Luke, or excuse me, in John eleven forty one, he says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me, that you're a father who's listening. I knew that you always hear me. You're always a father who is listening for me, whose ear is bent toward me. Now let me remind you that over and over and over and over throughout Jesus' ministry, he declared that he and the father were one. I and the Father, we are one. The Father is in me and I am in Him. So what does that mean? When we're struggling, Jesus will be a Father who listens. Whose ear is bent toward our struggles. When no one else is around, when no one else hears us, when no one else cares to listen, He says, I'm there for you. All you have to do is, is call on me. Now we know prayer is important, especially in times of struggle. Prayer shows our dependence upon God. Prayer is the way that we persevere through struggles. I mean, that's pointed out in the story itself. Jesus prayed and he persevered through the struggle. The disciples didn't pray, they fell asleep and failed. Right? There's your example. Prayer didn't deliver Jesus from the struggle. Keep that in, in mind. Just because you pray doesn't mean God's going to remove you from that struggle. It didn't deliver him from the struggle, but it carried him through it. Those are important things about prayer. But see, often we just fail to do it. We give up on it. And it may be because we're not sure if God's listening. That's what I'm trying to show you today. You can absolutely know that any time you call on Him, He is listening. I didn't share this particular verse, but it's one of my favorites uh, with the first service. But go to Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3 someday, maybe this week. And um, if this happens to be a point that you're struggling with, just memorize this verse. It says, call on me and I will answer you and show you things and I'm going to paraphrase this, that you've never known. Call on me, because I am a father who's listening, and I will, not I might, or if I get around to it, I will answer you. And I'll begin to show you things that you've never seen before. Incredible, incredible promise in the Bible. So Jesus is a friend who's ministering. He's a father who's listening. And number three, he is a fashioner, who is working. All right, so just forgive me of that word fashioner, uh, but my OCD, alliteration, all kinds of, just I couldn't do anything else but to put a word there that started with F. Okay, so that's just the way it is. Uh, you, have, you have to take the good with the bad. But what I'm meaning here is that even in our struggles, sometimes that's when we, when we wonder, is God here? Is he listening? Is he doing anything? Maybe God's taking the day off, and it just happens to be on my worst day ever. It's not so. Nothing can be further from the truth. Sometimes God is working the most in our deepest struggle, in our darkest hour, 
when we think he's doing absolutely nothing. He is doing the most. He is fashioning us and our lives. He's molding us, working us into the people that he wants us to be so that we can accomplish what he wants us to accomplish. He is fashioning us to be our best. Like I say, I know in the struggle, that seems the farthest thing from the truth, but it is the absolute truth. And I can prove it to you. Because I don't, listen, I don't know what's going on in your life, and I don't know what the struggle may be. Last week we had people in both services fill in the front of this, this church. This altar is just full of people. You know, casting over these worries, these concerns, these anxieties. You know, people even came up here and dropped the rock that I, bring, that I brought last week. But I guarantee you, whatever struggle that you're thinking about right now, it was probably attached to that worry that you were thinking about last week. One in the same, okay? And I'm trying to show you today that as bad as it is, Trust me that God is at work in your life. God is wor working. He's fashioning something so that you can be your best. And, and like I said, here's what I'm going to share with you to prove it. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17 says this. Our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Listen, I know that that word small throws you off. You they don't know what I'm going through. In the grand scheme of eternity, it's itty bitty bitty. He says, our present troubles, our struggles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce. Here's what the, here's what the struggle's purpose is. These struggles, these temporary issues and battles, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs all of them and will last forever. Present struggle, its purpose, eternal glory. I mean, that, that's a pretty good trade. That's, that's a great deal. If I go through some struggles now, God's going to use that to, to bring about the best in me that lasts for not just a lifetime but beyond. That's incredible. Another verse that you might want to memorize is Romans 8, 28, where Paul said, God is working for the good of those who love Him and who are called for His purpose. God is always working for the good for those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. That's where we'll stop today. But I just want to challenge you to take the next few minutes and, and concentrate on not just the struggle, whatever that is, but the solution. Jesus says, I'm here to rescue. I'm here to help. I want to be that friend that you need during this time in your life to encourage you, to support you, to minister to you. I am that Father that you can call out to anytime you need about whatever it is and know that I'm listening. I hear you. And I'm at work. I'm doing something. Even if you're unaware of it, even if you can't see it right now, trust me and trust my word that I am working for your good because I know you love me and I've created you with purpose. That's a good word for you today. And so I hope you don't leave here and forget it. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you can feel free if you'd like to come forward to do that. But at this moment, I'd just like to take the time to pray for every single one of us. God, we love you. Thank you so much for this word of encouragement today how you are here to help to rescue those who are struggling. You know, last week we touched on a very sensitive topic and a lot of issues that we worry over. And people were casting those things over 
last week. But so often, we'll take those worries and, and we'll lay them up, we'll lay them down, and then we'll pick them back up again. And that in itself is a struggle. We're trying to do and to carry things that wasn't intended for us to do, a burden that wasn't intended for us to, to carry alone. And so today's message is just a reminder that we don't have to struggle by ourselves. You've promised to be that friend. You've proven to be. You're a father who is always listening and inviting us to call on you in times of trouble when we're struggling. And when we do, we begin to see and you begin to reveal to us how you are working. So today, Lord, we just want to ask, one, if you could show us how you're working, you know, what you're doing in our life to bring about good, God, open our eyes to that. But, but we understand sometimes, you know, you don't reveal those things until, until much later. So it might not be. Today might not be the time of revealing. Today may be just the day that we need to settle in and trust. To call out on you and let you work. Let you work to bring out the good in us, the best in us, that we know translates to glory for you. So God, we trust you today. Do a mighty work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand?